Welcome to Cordell and Cordell's Men's Divorce Podcast, moderated by managing partner and CEO Scott Trout, bringing you information for guys before, during, and after divorce, and everything related to family law. This podcast is not to be taken as legal advice, and no attorney-client relationship is established. Hey, welcome back to the Men's Divorce and Cordell Cordell podcast. I'm Scott Trout, Managing Partner, CEO, and today I'm joined by a frequent guest, Christina Manthe. Welcome to the show. Hi, good afternoon, Scott. How are you doing today? Good. So we're going to talk a little about uh, social investigators, therapists, expert witnesses, which is a great topic. And, you know, it's oftentimes integrated into cases, but as always, this isn't legal advice, as you know. You need to schedule a consultation with an attorney and we're available. Obviously, you can go to the website, cordellcordell.com. You can schedule a consultation right from the website. Don't even need to pick up the phone, put in your zip code, find an office near you. It'll pull up a calendar of available times, dates in person on the phone, Zoom, just like this, whatever is convenient for you. So check out our social media. We'll have virtual town halls coming up just like we did and go to the YouTube channel. You can see all of our previous stuff and subscribe to iTunes podcast and you'll get dropped every time we get one of these. So, all right, let's get to it and let's talk a little bit about it generally about uh, social investigators and therapists and every state calls them something different. So, you know, here in St. Louis, we have, uh, you know, these, this um, social worker department and they're specialized and they're captured within the county courthouse and department of social services, whatever it may be. Um, Obviously, it's something that may or may not be involved in the case, generally speaking, but why would you want one? Maybe that's the place to start. Of course. So, Scott, you're absolutely right. There are so many different types of experts that fall under the umbrella. I mean, social investigator in Florida is going to be the most common that we're going to hear about, but we've got guardian ad litems. We've got all different kinds, parenting coordinators. Um I mean, one of the most common things that guys are facing is he said, she said. And whenever there's kids involved, most courts are not letting your kid in the door. They don't want to hear from your kid because really it's to protect your child and make sure that they're not being exposed to the litigation system. But that's when you can bring in one of these individuals who usually has a mental health background, who can cut through some of that nonsense, can investigate your claims, the other side's claims, and bring in that neutral voice to the court. And it's a great way to get some information in and add credibility to your story. Are your guardian and litems in Florida, are they attorneys? Are they you know, licensed social workers, therapists, anything that they have training in? So yes, a lot of our social investigators and guardian ad litems are attorneys. Uh, usually it'll be an attorney ad litem if it's an attorney. So it's not necessarily a requirement. I think that's definitely something that you want to talk to your attorney about when you're selecting the right expert for your case. Because if you want that attorney background, which many of us do, then we just look into the credentials of the experts that we use so that you're picking the right person for your case. It is. It's, you know, I for me, you know, I, I'm I'm iffy in terms of guardians here in Missouri, you know, typically it'd be like me and I'm not qualified to be a custodial expert in terms of therapy and understanding psychological issues. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, he said, she said, almost I'm going to be subjective and try to figure out who it is. But for example, as you said, cutting through that, uh, I just met with a client yesterday and there's an allegation. Oh, he's got an alcohol problem. This is a post divorce issue just simply because, uh, someone saw this person walking into a social club. I mean, they, during the day, they didn't see them drinking, didn't see them, you know, overindulging, whatever it may be. They were just having a meeting. Now it's a he said, she said. So this is a great opportunity. And, and in fact, it may trigger in Missouri, you have this obligation to appoint someone when you have a kind of something involving the children, allegations of abuse, neglect. And this is kind of triggering that. So I, I see that as an opportunity where, Rather than my client getting up there and saying, no, I didn't. And she said, yes, you did. Really, what happened? It's is a great chance to, to cut through that. Oh, absolutely. Um, because 
the judge has to make a decision on who's telling the truth. The judge doesn't know you. And so when you have somebody that can actually look into it, I mean, most of our social investigators, they do have that. I, they're usually attorneys and they have a mental health background, which really just makes them even more impactful in a courtroom. But they have the ability to administer the SASE, the substance abuse test that mental health professionals use nationwide. Um, they can go ahead and refer you out to do drug testing because they, they get powers with that order that appoints them that can kind of dictate where they need their investigation to go. And let's say yeah. you have substance abuse evaluations. I tell my client, if you have nothing to hide, obviously always be upfront with your attorney. If you have nothing to hide, then submit yourself to the exam and let that exam exonerate you. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's, it's a little bit risky sometimes, I think, because it, I don't know why we say it's a likability contest, um, but you do have to prepare for meetings and conversations with these individuals and you want to be, you know, believable, reasonable, uh, but, it, you know, it does help bolster your position. If you can convince this person that, you know, what is going on, for example, in this case, so, yeah, I was just there to have food and I had nice tea and, you know, I don't have an issue. And now this person comes in and says, judge, I've done a thorough examination and I see no evidence which would suggest that this party has any alcohol problem. It's, I think it's powerful when you put the hands of this decision into a third party. It can definitely work in your favor as a client, especially if you're adamant that the allegations against you are unfounded because it takes that he said, she said out of the equation. It puts in somebody that the court is appointing and agreeing is an expert in their field to look into the allegations. Yeah. And they're doing the digging that the judge doesn't have the time or ability to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it gets into also in, in this very particular case, there's some allegations that the children have made comments about uh, dad's drinking during custody times, which, you know, who knows, they're younger. And uh, I've had in early in my career, we've done children who have testified in camera and it's that's always risky. And it, for me, it's always been the last resort because judges don't like it, at least here in Missouri. They don't want us to hear from the, the kids and put them on the spot. And it's a very difficult situation. And I've done it a few times only out of you know necessity. But this would be an opportunity, I presume, where you could get children's opinions, observations, facts into the record. Absolutely. So typically social investigators will have a cutoff depending on what age the child is, whether they actually do their own one on one interview outside the presence of the parents. But they do go to your home. They look at your children's room. They look at your kitchen. They evaluate the whole situation of where you're living with your kids and they watch how your kids interact with you. And one of my favorite parts of the social investigation is when they're commenting like the, the child is bonded to the parent. They react appropriately. It gives You're in that home setting it shows your ability to manage your household. And those are things that you can say all day on the stand. You can say, you know, I'm, I'm, gr I'm a great parent. I am excellent at disciplining my child. I feed them on this schedule. But if you actually have somebody that goes into your house and then can say to the judge, you know, I saw their house. It is appropriate. I've seen how they react to their children. That is just, it, it's just an impactful thing that is, is worth it in many cases. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it is that I, I've in podcasts, if those watching, listening, I've had podcasts where I've said before, it's it's a little dangerous in that once you do get this person involved, uh, I always paint the picture here in, in Missouri and in St. Louis, you enter a courtroom and you have two tables for the council and the parties. And inevitably for us, a guardian winds up either sitting in one of two places, one of three, actually. The jury box which is always a jury box and they seem to be independent or one of the side of the petitioner or to the side of the respondent and it, you know it could be working for you or it can be working against you and now you have this third party who is teamed up with opposing side to hammer your version of the events and so i would think it's worthy this is a great topic because i think it's worthy of a conversation with your attorney about look what is appropriate what are the costs benefits you know and detriments to this and is it, you know, what are the chances of success? And sometimes in cases where you have nothing else to turn to, this is the only thing you can do to try to get an advantage in your case. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I mean, a lot of times we have to tell clients, you know, the facts are against you. The allegations don't look good. And this can be a great tool to help. It can help rehabilitate an image. It can help build your story in a positive light. And you're right. I mean, it can look like the the individual is on one side or the other, but the investigation is the first step. 
And I would always recommend that you take a deposition so that you know what that person's going to say in court. You're essentially getting their side of the story, good or bad. And it helps you and your attorney prepare for how you're going to deal with the good and the bad in court. And it also lets you know where the person might be wavering because it gives you an opportunity to not just look at a report in black and white, but really dig into why they made the recommendations that they did. And a lot of times that can be useful to you in court as well in helping the judge understand your position. Yeah. So how many occasions and cases you think about where you've had some of these individuals where the court has disregarded their recommendations, suggestions, or opinions? So it's certainly far less often that the court is disregarding it altogether Mm -hmm. because the courts really do value these experts' opinions. Obviously, once we get the report and we can see, I'm not saying I haven't received a bad report. I've received a lazy report. And obviously, you're never using that expert again uh, where the client says, well, this never happened. You know, that's when you start digging in and you can actually counteract what the report says. But it's it's certainly far more common because we do have the benefit of some good experts that we work with. Yeah. So let's talk about privilege. Obviously, when we I do talk a lot about that with our clients who come in, especially when they come in with uh, a sibling, a parent, a friend, and they want to talk about the case. And I'm like, look, there's an attorney-client privilege associated, but it's perhaps breached, perhaps waived if you bring someone else in and we're talking about elements of the case. And you know, the, the, the whole theory that anything you can say will be used against you in a court of law. So what do they do? How do you balance and what happens with the privilege of anything if it exists when you use these individuals? Of course. So it depends on being uh, on which expert you're using, because obviously a social investigator is not appointed to be either party's mental health expert. And so you don't necessarily have that uh, that therapist privilege. And so there it is incredibly important to understand that that professional may not be acting in that capacity. And anything you say could end up in that report and they can testify to it no holds bar. So then you may also have a therapist. It could be your client's therapist or the child's therapist. In that situation, you'll have to deal with waivers of privilege and make the decision on whether it is beneficial and worth it to waive that protective privilege. Or sometimes it could be something as simple as having that expert come in and say, you know, yes, I do see this person. I treat them for this one limited issue. They come in every single week and I've had no concerns. And you're not waiving necessarily that privilege of what was said. Right. Have you had cases where the the privilege isn't waived, where you've got an agreement, you go in and the benefit was so great to go ahead and do that to address some of the concerns that you anticipated the court may have? I have actually. Recently, I had one case where substance abuse was a major problem. They said that, you know, this person is an addict. This person is constantly intoxicated. And the therapist was actually able to say, listen, I meet with this individual once a week. I am trained in social, uh, you know, in substance abuse. No, I'm not seeing the person for substance abuse because that hasn't been brought to my attention, but it's my job to weed through, you know, some of the nonsense and determine if somebody's lying to me. He shows up on time. He's always punctual. He communicates with me. His emails are coherent. I have never once encountered an experience in the last 21 months of seeing this individual where he's been intoxicated, either in my presence or sending me incoherent messages. And judges know if you're truly an addict and you truly have a substance abuse problem and that you need to get help for, a lot of times you can't get it together on a routine like that where someone's not noticing. Yeah. So we think about it's these types of individuals, counselors, therapists, guardians. There, there is, and I've had many occasions where I recommend to clients to get their kids some sort of therapy during the process. There's a place called Kids in the Middle here, which just helps kids understand the process of divorce and the transition time and understanding that now you have two homes and that what do you do and how do you balance it? But 30 years ago, I, I always tell the story of these uh, seminars that we have where I had a client And we hired a therapist just because the kids were bouncing back and forth equal time. And it seemed to be working. Their grades were improving. Uh, They were were a little bit more stable. They weren't acting out. So we had the therapist kind of observe these kids and meet with them weekly. And they came to testify and said, look, yeah, the kids are doing fantastic. In fact, I saw them at the beginning when it was one night a week, every other weekend, and they were struggling. Now that it's been equal time and they're splitting the time every other week and you know a couple of days during the week here and there, 
they're far more adjusted. And that was the testimony that we brought in because I didn't even need the, the therapist to talk about what the kids had said because that therapy and that testimony was like very, very, very important for the judge to hear. I, w- I would absolutely agree. I mean, there are several cases of mine where I will recommend therapy for kids. I mean, a lot of parents are resistant because they're worried about what their kids are going to say, but especially in a high conflict case, kids need that safe space where they can go and they can talk to an individual and, and you make sure that your your kids' needs are being taken care of in that way. And a lot of judges yeah. will respect that. And so you're absolutely right. We have these individuals that are meeting with the kids regularly and they don't necessarily have to say, you know, this is what was happening at mom's house. This is what was happening at dad's house. Therapists are mandatory reporters. If there's a problem, they have to say something. And so the fact that they don't have anything to say is sometimes a great thing in itself. And then also, if they can say, listen, I have been here through the beginning. I understand it was very contentious. And now these kids are moving to a very healthy place where they're able to be in both parents' homes and be comfortable. They don't need to waive the privilege. Yeah. Right. You know, interestingly, I've had cases with the difference between a a treating therapist and a forensic therapist where, you know, we're hiring someone, they're meeting with everyone, they're not really treating them, they're just evaluating them. Where I've had treating therapists refused, refuse completely to give me any information whatsoever, talk to me, appear for a deposition. I talk about, hey, you're going to have to come to trial. No, I won't. I need your records. I'm not going to give them. What do you do when you have a, a therapist that just won't cooperate? So that definitely happens because the privilege is just not is not only the patients, it's also the therapist that holds the privilege. And if that therapist thinks that it is too detrimental to let go of that information, even if your client might be asking for it or the other side might be consenting to it, the therapist might just clam up and say no. And I, I've recently run into that situation as well, um, where it was actually the social investigator. So the social investigator will communicate with both parties, therapists and children's therapists. And so as a part of their fact gathering mission, that's those are the individuals they communicate with. And like, for example, in Florida, our order specifically states the parties must sign a waiver so that your social investigator can communicate with these people. Well, the social investigator came back and said the the wife's therapist refused. And so unfortunately it happens. And so in those situations, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something bad. It just means that that therapist is being very cautious about that patient's records. Yeah. You know, in, in speaking of records, um, I have a case at set for trial where we have some uh, experts, therapists, and we've agreed, we, t- we took their depo and so each of us knew what the other would say. And we've agreed rather than having them to come in to testify, to just use the records and the therapists are far more comfortable not complicating their relationship with the patient, which is the children, by coming in to testify and then the kids feeling like they broke that breach of trust and and now they're sharing things that they don't know about. Um, have you had those occasions where courts have allowed records in lieu of uh, in-person testimony? Yes, that's always something you can discuss with your attorney is whether a records, um, essentially a records affidavit can be submitted with the records if both parties are on the same page and there's no further questions that need to be asked regarding the records. You know, maybe even some hearsay is redacted out of it. At that point, the court can accept it as long as everybody is agreeable. Yeah. So experts, so opinion testimony, that's always a, a tricky one where maybe walk through the fine line between a therapist who just talks about what's going on, diagnosing, you know, what's happening in the patient, what they're experiencing. And then the kind of that next step of saying, okay, based upon all this, I recommend this, you know, mm-hmm. where is that fine line? Can they do that? Or are you just using someone to come in and say, this is what's going on and what they're experiencing, but I can't tell the court, uh, you know, what the custody schedule should be. Of course. I mean, for me as an attorney, it's strategic whether I offer an individual as an expert or not. Maybe I don't want their opinion, but I do want them to say that my client has been here once a week for the last year. That's something that they can testify to is a fact. They have records, no opinions required. At that point, if the other side were to try cross-examining and asking questions about their opinion, I'd be able to keep it out. But often, A lot of our experts, like a social investigator will be a stipulated expert because we went to court on it. We got an order on it. They're already deemed an expert. But 
the, it, it really just depends on what the goal is. Um, a lot of times I tell the client, you know, a fact expert is somebody who can express what they saw, what they heard, what they perceived. And then it goes a step beyond if we're leaning on that expertise of the individual. It's, you know, in your professional ex- opinion, let me give you a hypothetical. And in this hypothetical, if this, this, and this were to happen, do you believe this would be detrimental to the child still? And then they can answer that question. And I think that that line of questioning can often help a court because this person has done such a deep dive into parties' lives that if we say, if, you know, if my client completes anger management, would that change your opinion? Right. And it's those little things that otherwise they would not be able to do. You know, judges... You know, they're human and, and I get it. I, they don't want to make decisions without, you know, perhaps someone who's an expert in the field. I mean, lawyers aren't experts in child psychology and they're not experts in understanding therapeutic things that benefit children. And that's why I do see you know, these types of individuals. Individuals can be extremely influential on a judge who really doesn't want to make the decision and then make a mistake. What they're doing is saying, look, I'm relying on a doctor. I'm relying on whatever it is, this counselor who has a master's in social work. And that's why I think, as you suggest, it can be so powerful to utilize them, but it is proceed with caution. Maybe that's the warning I would always say. It is. And I run into probably an equal amount of clients that really want these experts. And then the other half, they don't want the expert. And so a lot of times, obviously, we can oppose one of these experts. There's some there's some valid reasons why to do so. I mean, cost, if something is cost prohibitive, sometimes that's the reason why, and that's okay. Um, but once a judge has ordered it, it's happening. Yeah. And so my opinion, my <laughs> My recommendations to clients are that if it's happening, the best thing you could do, whether it's what you wanted or what you did not want, is to comply. Yeah. Because they're going to establish a timeline for you to fill out forms, to set meetings with them, to meet with your child and with you. And the more hesitant you are to comply, even if there's no issue, it could create the perception of an issue. And so that's something always to be very cautious of when you're dealing with these experts, because their opinion is lit of you is literally going to go into the court record and the judge is going to weigh that heavily. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to give the judge a reason or the, anybody to give you a reason not to like you showing up late is a big one. You know, early is on time. On time is late and late is unacceptable. It's always said. And that, that establishes an opinion of this person immediately. And, that, you just don't want anything negative to be said. And that's why it's all about appearance and presentation when you represent guys in divorce and modification and don't give anyone a reason to go anywhere other than the facts. And that's really it. So, well, Christina, thank you so much for talking about a great topic. We keep going on for an hour on this one and it just, just stresses the importance of having the conversation with your attorney. So thanks for joining. Of course. Thank you for having me. Well, keep tuning in for information like this, great topics as we do, and also watch out for our next virtual town hall where you can log in live, ask questions of Cordell and Cordell attorneys, and get answers right then and right there. So until next time, have a great week. 